All right, we're Let's recording. And I am live with Mr. Joseph Weinberg. Oh, I'm excited today. Joseph, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, Sonny. How are you? I am. I'm doing well. I'm uh, just, yeah, as I was mentioning to you, uh, the, the kids are home today. They're, they're, well, they're home every day, but today they're off from school. They're dressed up as reindeers, you know, in, in the Christmas <laughs> spirit, if you will. <laughs> they put up the Christmas that's, tree yesterday. So yeah, that's it's awesome. Good. Is, good it, is it snowing there yet or no? It is not snowing, thank goodness. My my parents who are in Alberta, they sent me pictures of like minus 20 weather with, uh, you know, uh, ankle high snow already. So (laughs) yeah, it's hitting parts of Canada. And uh, yeah, you're, you seem like you're in warmer weathers. (laughs) Yeah, Barbados is not very snowy, but um, it's a bit rainy now. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back to Canada soon. <laughs> hey, hey, Joseph. So normally I like to get started with uh, where did we first meet? And I usually yeah. don't even know the answer to that. I'm trying to remember. Uh, was it where was it? I I think the first time we ever met was like 2014, I think, maybe even the end of 13, at a Starbucks on Bay Street. I'm pretty sure actually, and it was from an intro email when you were working, I think, at Buttercoin. Um, and it was, we first had our first coffee and started talking about Bitcoin and, and like the early, early days of that, that was, I think the first one, or else it might've been at one of the earliest meetups that we had in Toronto. One of the two, I can't quite remember, but, um, it was, yeah, maybe both. I don't know. We'll say both. So I, 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 I interviewed, uh, Bennett three days yep. ago, Bennett. Uh, Hoffman, who was the CTO at Buttercoin, so that was interesting, and also Anthony Diorio, which, which uh, that's all, that's all. how was how was Anthony's good? Oh, Anthony's it was good. epic! It was epic as usual. He took his time and yeah, went into a lot of things, you know. And that's a cool thing I'm learning about this is that um, everyone has a different lens, but there are threads, there are common threads, and uh, we'll get to those later. Okay, so Joseph, I, I always say that I think I, I truly believe your story is one of the most fascinating ones I've definitely heard. Um, I mean, just inside and outside of Bitcoin, but I was wondering if, uh, if maybe we could get started there. And, and, you know, I, yeah. I always like to say, I, I like to, you know, we treat Bitcoin. I think, you know, we can all agree that Bitcoin had a bit of a, um, an impact in all of our lives. Right. And, of course. and so I like to treat that as a bit of a singularity. And so kind of understand number one, what was your life like, uh, and your life story before, Learning yeah. about Bitcoin, and you can take it back to the diaper. You can pick it back yeah. to university. You can take it back to your first job, yeah. whatever you want. Um, Definitely. And then, and then the second part is to that question is kind of like after learning about Bitcoin, you know, what kind of opportunity? I mean, you've been you're one of the few people that have kind of been in the space, uh, leading the space, doing a lot of cool things. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's let's, yeah. let's let's start. Start from the beginning. Yeah. So I was born and raised in Vancouver, BC. Um, and had a amazingly interesting, let's say upbringing. I was very lucky in that I traveled a lot and my parents are always like pushing me towards like, you know, seeing new places, like, you know, as much as possible. Right. So uh, at an early age, we were kind of trying to always, you know, see the world and understand people's views. Right. And I think that that was like a really important, you know, uh, grounding for, um, you know, everything that ended up happening once I met Bitcoin, as you can say. Um, so well, went to university in, in Vancouver, um, was in a third year computer science class um, and discovered Bitcoin, or as my friend called it, um, there was three of us working on a project, the Bitcoins. Uh, and this was in 2010 in, in like December, I think 12th, maybe 10th. Um, so it was like right before the winter, right before the family was going to go skiing at Whistler or whatever, go up for like the holidays. We were in third, third year computer science class. Uh, and my friend Julian was like, hey, this could be a really good, we were trying to understand like what type of a P2P library we could use for some, for, for some class project we were trying to do. So my friend was, I guess, on SourceForge, because that's where Bitcoin was at the time prior to GitHub and everything. It's like where like the earliest version uh, actually of Bitcoin was, was actually uploaded to SourceForge. Um, and so... One thing led to another, like they were, you know, we were, we were going through our computer class. It didn't end up working the way we wanted to in, in trying to like fork a piece of like the Bitcoin network itself um, or the Bitcoin's like P2P libraries. Um, but then after my exam, I like, you know, I was walking out of, out of school, I was like getting ready to go home. And, and then my friends are sitting like kind of like on the side of our classroom. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like go home, see your families. And they're like, no, like we're actually going to like, 
do the mining on the Bitcoin thing. And I'm like, what, the hell? what, is, what are you guys talking? Like, what is this? Like, okay, I didn't really get it. Um, and so, you know, one thing led to another January in 2012 came along, you know, they were still going at it. So we set up a bunch of laptops, set up a bunch of computers, and we're just like kind of trying to, you know, like mine Bitcoins kind of for fun. Um, so we did that for like about a year, um, just as like, you know, just buddies from, from a class, you know, it was like on and off, it was pretty relaxed. And like at that time, like Bitcoin was in my view, like I was a major in communications and, and double minored in econ and comp sci. And I was always looking at it more as like a tool of communication, you know, like I always viewed like Bitcoin as this like interesting form of like communication more than a financial instrument. Right. Um, and, and, and the idea behind communications was really, really interesting to me, right? Like the idea that we can allow digitization and communication technology was, was something that I was like really, really interested in. Um, and so, you know, I kind of always looked at it as like, how can we express money in different ways? Like, cause money is communication and that's always been my like philosophy, right? And the more freedom around that, you know, just meant a better ability to access communication communication of value was something that was cool. Um, but like at that time, you know, I was like, I was 19, just turning 20. Like I was like basically a kid. I don't know what I was doing in my life. Um, of course, everyone, I think still trying to figure it out. Uh, and then I kind of made this like abrupt change where I was like, you know what, like I have to get out of the Western world. Um, and so in the end of 2012 uh, or mid mid May through 2012, actually uh, in August, I was finishing, I went to, through my grad and I then moved to the Peruvian Amazon. I was like, you know what? I'm in a 360 flip everything here. I got to go and just like experience what life is like outside of this bubble that is the Western world. Um, and that took me on a, initially a backpacking trip with a friend of mine. We went to Machu Picchu. We did the whole Peruvian thing. And one thing led to another and we, we ended up, uh, you know, crossing paths with a, another group of people that said we were going to live with this tribe in the Amazon. And I was like, that's weird. That is so non like traditional and it, I, it was scary and everything. Um, and you know what? Booked the next flight, went into the heart of the Amazon, was going there for like six days just like a quick trip it was like scary we were like we don't know what we're doing none of these people are going to speak english like this is totally a, a, a you know a mind shift but it was exactly like what i was looking for you know um and it was only once i got there did i understand and i like start to devote myself to like bitcoin and like the philosophies that like underlie um decentralization and i'll get to that in a second but uh, like, i'll never forget it the first drive down a mud road with mud huts with people that don't wear clothes, you know, and, and we like immersed ourselves in this community uh, that was deep in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. They didn't even have, they didn't have, you know, smartphones. They, they, but the one things that they had were like so interesting. And then and, and actually what ended up happening was I was supposed to stay for, uh, you know, uh, about a week. We ended up staying for about a month. But then I left and I came back for about eight months. And then I've been back and forth ever since for the last 10 years now, uh, like living and reimmersing myself with this tribe. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, the thing that like really nailed it for me was, was there was this one moment. And I remember we were walking down this mud road. We were going from one village to the next. And there was a, a Western Union. Okay. And this Western Union was literally a mud hut with like no walls. And it had a sign that said Western Union on it, right? And they were using phones. They weren't smart yet. Uh, like, yeah, a lot of like the tribe didn't, wasn't even wearing clothes at this point, right? So this was like pre-industrialization or let's say like the immersion of the Western culture into this tribe, right? And, and it kind of like clicked for me. I was like, wow, wait a minute. These people have no banks. They have no access to financial services. If they want to go to a bank, it's a three hour trek a lot of the banks wouldn't even accept them because they didn't have a form of proper identification, right? And then I realized that I'm like, wait a minute. So like if Bitcoin could be successful as a form of value transfer, these people wouldn't need to travel for literally like almost a day back and forth just to get access to banking. Hopefully they get access to banking. There's a lot of racism. And so it's, they're, they're scared to go into cities like that. There's a, it's a cultural issue. But like, if this could work, you could effectively free their ability 
to utilize commerce, right? And utilize commerce in these small unknown places that are either, um, you know, disprivileged in the sense that the access to the traditional system just isn't there for them, or they're actually purposely excluded just because of different qualities, right? Um, and in that Western Union, like I'll never forget it because it was that one thing where I was like, wow, the power to enable remittances could be and would be probably the most incredible use case for Bitcoin. This idea that we could move money and let value transfer all over the world. Um, and it's something that was incredibly meaningful to me. And so um, ever since then, like for the last 10 years, we've been funding this tribe. I actually gave the tribe Bitcoin uh, like in, yeah, in like 2011, gave them like, I don't know, uh, like a, I don't know, I think it was like five or 600 Bitcoin at the time. Um, they still have it. They actually don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to spend it. I don't even no. know if you knew, knew. I don't even know if you, I told you this. Yeah. Um, but so the, the, <laughs> the, 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 tr the tribe actually was given like, yeah, like a private keys. Um, and it was like a, cause like in their culture, like, and there's such so many interesting, like, uh, correlations, right? Like they are a consensus driven culture. They're not this top down hierarchical system. And I'm like, I'm, I've, I've learned so much from just how they operate and how similar it is to our ecosystem, right? Like they don't have this, this rule of law. So in the, in that environment, in that, in that culture, there's no police, they're self-policing. The number one thing you don't do is you do not steal. Steal comes with like death. But everything else, you self-organize and you lead by consensus. The, the highest people, let's say, that everyone speaks to are the doctors, the healers, or the shamans, as they call them, in those cultures. But apart from that, they don't have a, you know, a president or a prime minister that dictates their, their, their world, right? And it's very much a self-organizing and self-governing system. Um, and, and like, I found that to be really powerful because it's just a different approach, right? It's also a female driven society instead of a male driven society, like what we have in the Western world and all these other things. Um, and it was, it was such an incredibly eye opening experience just to see that like people are happy, you know, they don't have a lot but like they live off the nature and they live with nature. And like, you know, the, the idea of money and what it means is just very different in that society. And so I, I felt, you know, I took a lot away from, from, from being there. Um, and so every year we kind of fund them and like keep their, their ecosystem moving. We're building schools um, for teaching healing and all these different things and, and spiritual schools to keep shamanism alive. Cause that's what their culture really is driven off of. Um, and, you know, doing what we can to like use our Bitcoin for good is like effectively what it is. Um, and, and so that was my like real, you know, I would say the, the most groundbreaking moment for me and, and really what tied me to this idea that if we can free money, if we can make it accessible, like we can actually change the lives of people who need it way more than we do sitting in the bubble of, you know, Western civilization um, while also keeping their cultures alive. Right. Um, and, and so that was like a, a, a incredibly defining experience for me. Um, and, and it taught me kind of a lot about a different part of the world and, and just how we can live as humans. Um, and so, and we can talk more about that, I'm happy to, but, uh, and that was like, I think a pivotal life changing. And it's really when I went from like a kid to, you know, uh, I guess more of a grown up, let's call it. Um, and so then I moved, you know, what happened? I was, I was in the jungle for all, probably like 12 maybe 16 months, uh, maybe a bit less. Yeah, about 12 months. Um, then moved to Toronto. I was like, hey, listen, I need a job. Like, this is all cool, but like, I need to figure out what I want to do with my life. And, um, and so I went to work at a company called Extreme Labs. Uh, Extreme Labs was the largest mobile application developers in the world. So uh, in the very first versions of smartphones, um, there were not a lot of core development shops globally. So um, we worked with Facebook, we built Facebook mobile, Messenger, we built Uber, Instagram, Twitter, um, every financial application in Canada, the majority of the US banks. Um, basically, if you were using it on your phone, I, in 2012 to 2015, 16, all major global applications were developed by the company that we were working at. Um, and I was in 2013. And, um, and then effectively uh, what happened was at the end of 2013, we were acquired by a company called Pivotal, um, which is a spin out of EMC and VMware. It's big, big SF companies. 
and Bitcoin started started like you know its first big skyrocketing move, right? Um, what year are we in now? You said twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. So, yeah, okay, so this, okay. This was in the the moment of twenty thirteen, um, and this this is kind of when I was like, wait a minute, like Bitcoin is actually gaining momentum. It's no longer this fun, cool project in in you know in computer science class. Um, there's actual people are talking about it. People and things are starting to happen. Um, this was early days of Decentral, you know, like there was this community being built. Um, was your pivotal job in Toronto or was it in Vancouver? It was in itself? Toronto. Where, where so I'd you? moved to Toronto mm -hmm. right at the end of 2012. And I was only at, at Extreme Labs for like a year, maybe just over a year. Um, or in early 2014, we, as we got acquired in end of 2013, Bitcoin was flying. I was like, okay, I'm back in on this. Like, this is cool. It actually <laughs> got legs. People care, you know? Um, and then, yeah, left Extreme Labs or Pivotal, which it turned into, um, and then went right into the space and kind of never looked back. Um, and that's around, I think, where we like first met is like right around that, that, that big turning point. And when per everyone in the world, really, I say, kind of really first learned about what Bitcoin is. Um, what, what were the key things then, I guess, just in summary, like of, of what you just shared that, that, uh, so a couple of things I heard is, I mean, you had an affinity towards computers, obviously, right? Or you were in courses, you learn, you were tinkering with them, yeah. whether it would be with your friends. You also had another thread that I find common amongst a lot of Bitcoiners, which is travel, yeah. right? Like it was, you weren't just like stuck in your bubble, you got out of it and you started to see the world from other people's kind of perspective and started to see what, you know, maybe um, is common amongst us all, right? Even some people living in Peru. And by the way, it's ironic that, I don't know if you heard, but my, my sister-in-law, by the way, lives in Peru. Um, so she was just telling us recently that they, their president, I think, is no longer or something. I mean, there's something going on in Peru. Oh, right really? Now. It doesn't. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. Interesting. Well, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like in the tribe. So when you're talking about like no leaders and stuff, I was thinking like, I know he's talking about the tribe, but like yeah. right now countrywide, I don't think they have a president that's even or something. More... I, I, that's what I just heard. So <laughs> yeah. Well, like and, and it's like in, yeah, the, yeah. in their lands, they are segregated from like the traditional Peru. So like in tribal lands, they are not governed by the government of Peru. They're entirely self. Interesting. Yeah. Right. So it's really this like self-organizing hmm. system. Uh, which is like this consensus driven system, which I, I don't know. I always find this that, cool correlation, right? Like, yeah. Like they're, and they're probably going to be wealthier than the Peruvian government soon because yeah, of that donation you gave one them. One day. Yeah. <laughs> once, once they figure out how to use it, like they have no idea how to use it. So they're like, ah, but yeah. Um, but they will, they yeah. will soon. Okay. okay yeah. So continue. So, so, but, and then, and then, and well, but what about Bitcoin was it that, that really caught your, so it sounds like the remittance and the fact that you could move money, it's like yeah. the, the price aspect of it and what it's, other, it, to me, it's never been about price. It's never been about this like speculative trade, right? Like I've really like, I've taken this whole ecosystem with the thought that it's like, if we have an opportunity to change the world, which we really, really need one quickly, I think the world is moving into very, very, you know, uncomfortable positions. Like what are systems of freedom that can provide both an accelerated option at choice but also that can actually quickly change the world very very fast because i think that we have a requirement to do so um and i think that like they're the majority of people who are excluded those are the people that we can actually change and and my mission in life is to figure out how we can affect the most change to the most amount of people as quickly as possible whether that be a paradigm change a shift in in in, in people doing never things that we do every day um or it's actually bringing you know people that live on a dollar a day up and above that right like i think that we have the technology and tools to do it uh, i just think that western civilization and capitalism in some cases um, does it incentivize those types of options, right? And so I feel Bitcoin to be this tool that we can use um, or, or the protocol at the very least is a tool that we can use to enable that option to more people. Um, and that's exactly what the internet's done. It's the exact same thing with mobile phones. And I think that an idea that, that a money internet is something is incredibly valuable and important and fundamentally can impact lives of people that you know we don't live around today. Um, and that's what I care about. It's like, how do you affect those types of people's lives and give them freedom of choice? Um, that's been like my big thing. Very interesting. Right? Okay, so so now what happened? So I guess you leave Pivotal. That must have been a bit scary though, right? Like going from like a super massive big company where you're dealing with, I don't know, banks and like the biggest companies in the world. Yeah. Now being like, okay, well, uh, good luck with that one. Like you, you're, <laughs> you're floating in the middle of an ocean by yourself. Like how do you yeah. deal with that? 
Yeah, like, I mean, like, it was uh, it was an easy choice and a hard one in that, like, even the founders, like, of Extreme Labs were coming to us. Like, it was a time where everyone was talking about Bitcoin internally. You know, these were um, actually Chamath Hapitalia. He was our biggest investor. And so all of his best friends were the CEOs and founders of Extreme Labs. And so um, they, they were all coming to me being like, how do I buy Bitcoin? How do we do this? Right. So, like, the choice was hard. But it was also, it, there was so many proof points that it was like, you know, the space better than anyone at the time. Every one of these tech thought leaders in Canada were kind of coming to, to me being like, what's going on? And so it was scary, but, um, but it was like, I just could tell it was the right move. It's like, I want to start something of my own. I want to start building in the space. There was nothing really in Canada that I thought made sense at the time. Um, you know, there was exchanges that were, you know, iffy to say the least, CA Vertex and a variety of others were, were well trying to figure it out, right? It was such an early time. Um, and so, and, 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 and Joseph Extreme yeah. Labs was what they like, I mean, they were essentially one of Canada's like first large kind of mobile houses, right? Like it was they, the, they did, it was you know, the world. Like, what, what, what was their key to fame or claim to fame? And whatnot. so the claim to fame for Extreme Labs is that they were the first people to effectively build the best applications in the world. Like we built the re Facebook came to us, Uber came to us, Airbnb came to us, um, Instagram was, it was Tinder built. also a function of Tinder, like, Tinder was actually <laughs> Tinder was born out of Extreme Labs out of something called Hatch Labs. Mm. So like basically the entire mobile revolution, as you might call it, and the and the first iterations in mass mobile adoption was actually built inside of Extreme Labs. So like, which is in Toronto, which is, right? Yeah, I don't think most people yeah, know like that. Most people most people have no <laughs> idea, but like Facebook would not build mobile internally. They would come to us and we would develop all mobile applications on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Be like you name it, we literally were the initial developers that enabled those mobile application types. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and it was like an interesting time. It's like, you're dealing with the largest, most fast growing early tech companies like on earth. Um, and these guys were very good. Right. And, and a lot of the team that, that we have, you know, even still with us today, uh, came from that initial, um, group. Right. So like when I, you know, bring on a developer or an engineer, they're coming out of this generally out of this tribe that came from Extreme Labs because they were the best in design and development. Uh, and Toronto has been very, very well recognized for that, um, although they've spread to many places now. Um, but yeah, we have this incredible talent pool in, in Toronto that's been unmatched in a lot of things globally. Uh, and I think that's why you see tech companies going there today and, and everyone's you know, making the shift towards, you know, Canada at the very least. But um, <clears throat> yeah, and it was... It was also like an interesting time because like what it end, ended up happening is that I had found a team inside of Extreme Labs who's actually with me still today where that were, you know, ended up basically becoming my co-founders. Um, so I was the first one to leave. A lot of them left shortly after. And we said, listen, we don't know what we're building in crypto yet. We don't quite have a clue. We're still trying to figure this out. Um, but we know that we want to do something, right? And we want to really like build something. And so... Um, yeah, continue. Sorry about that. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, no. And so it was this incredible time. It was the most talented group, I, in my view, of engineers and designers in the world that like, yeah, like no one really knew about, right? And uh, this Extreme Labs, like it, it really, it gave me a good perspective on the world. And like, and, and the biggest thing, which was so cool was that like, we were the only ones building the largest mobile banking applications on earth, right? So like any, you name it, every one of pretty much every one of the big banks in Canada, we were building like these very early versions of financial institution, you know, applications and user experiences and, and really like figuring out what banking was um, at the, the financial mobile level. Right. Um, and that was an incredibly interesting time. And it, it gave us a lot of inroads into, you know, the financial system. And it was also a cool contrast because I'm sitting there being like, and I was talking to a lot of the guys who were running mobile in CIBC and in these other banks, um, which are the big five in Canada, and and kind of asked them, like, what's up with Bitcoin? Like, and, you know, at that time, they were like, you guys are nuts. Like, you know, it was just way too early. Uh, I do think that's fundamentally changing. We can talk about that later. But um, but it gave us this just incredible breadth of, of, of experience and knowledge and understanding of where both technology was going and mobile was going, but also, like, how to build product teams, right? Like, 
how do you build a great environment for people? How do you how do you bring together the smartest people to do really, really interesting things, right? Um, and what's that lean, agile development kind of, you know, cycle look like? And, um, and wasn't that pro- also not invented, but there's yeah, something it like really actually was. interesting, was it? Yeah, so okay. pair programming was pretty much, I'm not sure if it was, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, audience, but I'm, I'm 90% <laughs> sure that pair programming was developed by Pivotal, which was a small dev shop and Extreme Labs basically like took this thing called pair programming and really made it like global scale. And so it was this idea. What is pair programming? You yeah. got to explain it just because I so, think it's one of the coolest things. Yeah. So pair programming <laughs> is the idea that every single piece of code that's written in a development process is actually being done by two programmers. You have one who's writing and one who's constantly reviewing. And then they're flipping back and forth. What it means is that you have this accelerated development iterative and development process that just allows you to get agile adoptive development done really, really, really quickly. Um, because it means that like, if someone's re- read, like someone's writing, someone's constantly watching and it's constantly flipping back and forth. And this is what it was that like we, this was effectively the biggest sell for us. It was that like, we could do this pair programming agile development to a Facebook or an Instagram or a Twitter. Uh, you know, the earliest versions of Twitter were built in this pair of pro- programming methodology at Extreme Labs. Um, and, uh, and of course, Tinder and all these other, you know, big companies, um and uh, uh, i say reliability yeah. it's faster but you'd also think you know now in our space security also right like you think you'd lend to better security practices because yes. you don't have some dude you know inserting a few lines of code that's gonna like wash you a hundred percent right like yeah a couple months down the road or something and inserting i think some bug or whatever i think not that that would happen but i'm saying well you know. i mean if you go to DeFi, <laughs> trust no one <laughs> DeFi, or, yeah don't trust verify right like i think DeFi could probably learn from that in, in the ethereum space could probably learn from pair programming and build things properly right but um but yeah no and that's exactly what it was it was like you can audit a lot faster with like a much higher guarantee threshold right um and it's the only thing it challenges that it's hard for small startups right so it's like it only works when you have a very big development team and you're able to do this right but uh but yeah studies have shown that like this pair programming approach has been an incredibly effective way uh at building rapid applications and doing it very very effectively so yeah it was a, an incredible experience it taught us how to build teams and you know what sprints look like and how you define them in the most appropriate ways and uh and also just like from a business development perspective it was probably the most amazing environment like you could ever imagine like the ability for a small company like that to go after facebook twitter uber small company in canada just bringing in these giants today uh, into these like development cycles and actually having our, like it was to the point that at one point our enter- engineers were now merged into Facebook, right? So there was an Extreme Labs team that lived inside Facebook's core offices, right? And that was kind of the, uh, the it was an incredible experience. Yeah, um, it must have been really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was. And it was, uh, you know, <laughs> things have changed a lot since then and, and everything, but uh, it was an incredibly uh, pivotal time, I guess you could say. Uh, and really where so, I learned. So, so yeah. you have this like worldview, you've lived in the in a, in a Peruvian tribe uh, and now you're in like a space and, you know, in Toronto, really at the leading kind of cutting edge of tech. You're also, you know, aware of this Bitcoin thing and it keeps uh, rearing its head. And like you said, the price kind of uh, was going nuts. People were maybe asking you about it. What what then? Yeah. What happened? Like, yeah, what did you, you left and you started what? Yeah. Paycase at the time or something yeah. else? Yeah. So I started Paycase, which was I mean, at the time we, I kind of just left and said, I'm going to figure it out, right? Like what, we're mm-hmm. going to figure out something in the space. And there was a lot of ideas running around and throwing around. Um, and, and the important part was that I had a kind of a core team and uh, and, and my co-founder, Kian, basically was like, dude, get out of here. Like, you know, I will stay in for now and then come with you. And, you know, Nick and, and all these guys who are this core kind of co-founding team of Paycase <clears throat> uh, all basically left in, in over the course of 2014 to come and kind of join and just start trying to experiment, right? Like we we're trying to figure out like what made sense and how to do it, right? Um, <clears throat> we also didn't realize all the challenges involved. We, you know, we were, you know, very, very much exploring the space. Uh, but we always looked at like remittances as this like incredible 
you know, potential, you know, use case that we thought to be like an incredibly interesting one for, for Bitcoin, right? Like we always looked at like, what, what is it that you could impact locally that would have a global, you know, uh, impact, lo think locally, but act globally, right? Uh, and we couldn't, and I still today think that one of the best use cases for, for crypto is, is this ability to look at remittances, right? Um, but uh, so, yeah, so we started Paycase kind of just as an experimentation, figuring out what works, what didn't, you know, at the time. And ran into just so many like roadblocks along the way, <clears throat> um, and, and it was kind of in this in this standstill. Uh, and what ended up happening is Jaron um, from Coinsetter, who was working on this exchange, you know, in New York. Uh, we became very close friends. Uh, he had just started Coinsetter, so while we were kind of going to try to figure out what Paycase was and and or what we would focus on, Jaron came and said, "Listen." you know like we're coming into canada um we'd I'd love to work with you on this um come and join us for now like we know that you're trying to figure stuff out with paycase um but yeah so i joined as a director for coin setter they ended up acquiring ca vertex uh after the big blow up that happened there uh and so worked with jaron really closely on building kind of coin setter for uh for for quite a while and like at this time, we were still in kind of R&D on Paycase saying, OK, I think we're going to do remittances. Let's really understand user groups. Let's understand what the user problem is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then Jaron had come in. We started working and trying to get Coinsetter really to, you know, uh, fix the problems that had occurred at CA Vertex. And at the time in Canada, it's probably like good to know the, the history to most people is that there were really only like two exchanges, I would say, CA Vertex um, and Quadriga. <laughs> Uh, Quadriga was also, you know, very, very small. Uh, I got some crazy stories about Quadriga too that we can oh, get God. into, but uh, <laughs> uh, oh, for better or for worse, yeah. Um, but like, there wasn't a lot in Canada, right? And and uh, and it see, came, Vertex and it, was definitely the first because I yeah, mean, I, I was sure. there and I for bought sure. Bitcoin there, yeah. and it was the first. So that was pretty cool that you had, you had, you know, your story kind of yeah uh, cross paths with and it. Blew and it was up. from Calgary initially, and it blew up. And it, did it blow got, up though? Or did it? I did think it they just, got hacked. Yeah, something happened, they got right? Hacked like, for twenty million, and then they illegally oh. sold stock as like a security Duh. option or something, which no. which was like a no no. no. Nope. And so I think Barry Silver went to Jaron and said, this is a mess. Why don't you acquire the assets of CA Vertex? And, um, and then he called me and he's like, listen, man, like, you know, we're a small exchange in the U.S. You know, we're, we're, we're just starting out. Why don't you come on and join the team as like the director of the Canadian side? And we'll grow this thing together on both sides. <laughs> I think up to the point prior to acquisition of, of, of Coinsetter, um, it was actually the second largest exchange in North America next to Coinbase. So there was like kind of this head to head competition. So like Coinsider was really growing. Um, and then for one reason or another, Mount Gox happened, everything went to hell. Prices in 2015 went to zero almost, you know, there was this <laughs> huge lack of trust in the space. Um, but there was like a few really, really like, I think core threads that we noticed throughout the way. Right. And, 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 and and those threads, in my view, have become like the cornerstones of like what, you know, the financial industry is, but also what crypto is trying to get over its hurdles of today, right? Like, it was a weird situation when in 2015, late 2014, 2015, you're an exchange operator at Coinsetter and you're getting calls from the FBI. Like, you're getting calls from like, you know, like, not the CIA, but like CSIS. Like, you're getting calls on criminal investigation things. This is around the time of Silk Road. You're like 23 years old trying to build a business and like you're not just building a normal business you're building businesses that involve like very weird interesting individuals right the quadriga founders of sorts right it was a very early time in the space and and um and i think it it, it really made it very hard for anyone to build anything really really well right like like, you know, you, you'd never think that when you're building a startup, you're also, I mean, you're also going against the largest financial institutions on earth. So they're not very helpful to you. Our banking was thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month when we could get it. Um, that came with, you know, just like the calls from the most, you know, in interesting three and four letter word agencies across the United States and in Canada on investigations. And you're kind of sitting there being like, this is weird. Like, you know, usually you build a startup, build a product, launch it. It's fine. It's cool. But this was just not the same thing, right? It was like there was just so much early um, activity that was just from the darker part of the, the world. And so like you're kind of trying to meander this. 
Um, and I think that, that just made it and always made it hard for those first early guys uh, to kind of get things moving and get things done right. Uh, to top that off, like, so the big threads that we found was like compliance was a mess. You had, you know, FinCEN and FinTrack calling you every day trying to figure out, are you a money transmitter? Are you an MSB? They wouldn't license you. So you couldn't be a money service business, which is what remittance companies are, right? So you're not technically a money transmitter, but then like, and then are you taxed? We don't know what the tax laws are. So we don't know how to deal with that. The banks don't bank you because they don't even know what's going on. They just think that you're a bunch of money laundering psychopathic kids. Like it was just this like, you know, you're battling every different roadblock that's like not uh, normal for most startups to to go through, right? And uh, and like I think people like who are new to the space, like just you, they don't understand like the work that we've all done as early guys, as you know, you and I know well, like to get through these massive walls that were like very challenging early on. Um, I don't want to be a downer. It's just like these were the rides and the the you know the the things that happened, right? Uh, the Mount Goxes of the world just didn't help. The the Quadrigas don't help, right? Um, but they're just a product of these early days of of, of the, the internet of money, right? Um, so that's like kind of on the one side, that's on like the story of like getting things going. Uh, Coin Center was acquired in 2016 by Kraken, um, which was, I think, the, a really good move. It, it brought all the Canadian users that we were building and had built and kind of pulled the CA vertexes into Kraken, uh, allowed Jesse to really kind of continue to expand across North America, as you know, Sonny, of course, very well. Um, and that's kind of on the one side of the business track. Um, and then Paykeys really kind of started figuring out what it's, I think, like, what it was and what I found it to be important to do. So we started working on remittances. Then we kept getting hit with the same things. Banking was a problem. Liquidity in Canada was a huge issue, you know, getting and being able to like get these simple regulatory things over the line was literally impossible. Like we just couldn't figure out how to properly approach it. Right. Um, and so then I kind of recognized, I'm like, all right, there's some really big problems that we have to solve as a global community and as a, a local community in order to enable these businesses to work, right, at scale. Like, how do you solve the banking problem? Uh, how do you solve the policy and regulatory problems that we have? You know, like, how do we just get these simple things done so that e businesses in our ecosystem could grow? Um, and so I can get to that in a minute. Um, if we want, and I can talk about more like the early community, like the one thing that I'll take away from like, that I've like said this many times is like the 2014s and 13s and 15s and 16s, in my view, especially in Toronto, was like the most incredible time of my life. And, and I say that just because of like the construction of our community, you know, was like so vibrant and it wasn't like Bitcoin versus Ethereum and, you know, everyone hates each other. And I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember this, Sonny, but like, it was just all about ideas and learning and bringing people together and just like these like amazing events that like everyone would hold. You ran a lot of them, um, but it was not this like, you know, these holy wars, right? About like who's better and what's what. Um, and I'll just, those times for me were like the most amazing because it was just organic and it was natural and it was such interesting characters. Um, and, and I think that that's like a part of my life that'll always, you know, it's, and I think it's changed a lot. Now it's financial driven. The space is very much, you know, getting institutionalized. Um, and the playfulness is, I think, in many ways over. Um, but anyways, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's kind yeah, of so uh, fascinating. Sorry, I got, got lost <laughs> in, in trance there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, man. So, so, so we're at, we're at the point now where, I guess like pay case, you know, in terms of, so coin setter gets acquired by cracking. So now yeah. what, there's like a bit of a, not a vacuum, but now you're going, okay, well, remittance seems like an obvious opportunity, yeah. but uh, there are all these like, you know, um, big hurdles in the way, right. Whether it be, like you said, you know, regulatory, whether it be banking um, and yeah. And even it could be argued that, that even like the liquidity in Canada at that point didn't was work. like you just said, see vertex kind of <laughs> didn't work out, even though I, I, I take my hat off to, to, to the efforts there. Cause I mean, of that's course. what ushered in Bitcoin into Canada and, yep. and made so many people realize the, that there was a future here. Yep. Um, quadriga. Oh, uh, <laughs> nothing to say there, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but so, so what, what next, what's yeah. the next 
curious about like marketplaces and, and how you think about that. Yeah. So like what I realized at that point, like we tried to do remittances and, and we had users and we actually were like growing this. And Didn't I you have a picture with Justin Trudeau or something. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I just yeah. Remember like seeing something. Justin Trudeau, <laughs> Justin Trudeau, like our prime minister came to, you know, we, we like remittance is so amazing and it's such an interesting thing. Cause it's, it's the, basically it's it fe- like the, the institutions that control remittances, they feed on the lowest income populations on earth. Like, you know, like average prices are 10 to 30% per transaction. Like it's literally robbery. So like, you're literally like the biggest institutions have this stronghold on the remittance industry, which is like insane. And these are the people that are immigrating that have on average, the lowest amount of money on earth. And they're just like making enough to send home to their families, right? And Canada has such an interesting demographic situation. It was, it's a perfect place to build remittances. Um, and it's like, can, yeah. can I just say one yeah. thing on remittance? So one thing that I, yeah. that, that really makes me excited. And I, by the way, I came into Bitcoin too. Number one, because of digital gold, I, I did see yeah. million dollars of Bitcoin, you know, someday in our future. And so yeah. that, that I, and the fact that we can, protect ourselves from inflation, I think it is fundamentally important, but cross-border yes. remittance is a close second for me in the sense. And, and the reason is, is for what the reason that you just said is that, you know, people talk a lot about like foreign aid, Joseph, you know, like governments yep. dumping yep. money, in like poor countries. Um, but if you actually look, remittance is far more um, targeted, more beneficial, more efficient, more effective. There's just so many things better because it's my dad sending home money to his mom. You know what I mean? And like, she yeah. knows exactly yeah. what her bills are like, or, or whatever it may be. And so, um, so yeah, so, 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 so I'm a big advocate of like that 15% that's getting charged shouldn't be. Um, however, however, yeah. Bitcoin is difficult. It's like kind of hard. There's alphanumeric keys and you got, there's a learning process. So yeah, I guess, so how did, yeah. how, does, how does an entrepreneur so, you know, kind of solve for that? Yeah. So like we actually built like an incredibly amazing system where like our big thing was like, okay, if we're going to do this, how will we do this? And how do we do it so that we obfuscate the Bitcoin um, experience away from the users, right? And we have this incredible, it, it's, it's, we still have it today. The infrastructure is all still there. It's, it's amazing. Uh, and it was working, like we had users growing and it was this idea that like, you shouldn't have to know that Bitcoin's being used because like, what do remittance users care about? It's not about ownership and sovereignty of their money. It's about how do I know that this $1 gets to the Philippines almost instantaneously for a cheaper rate for a uh, seamless experience without the risk of knowing that my money's going to get stolen or anything like that and direct to user, right? And and so what we started to realize was that in order to do this, we needed to start, and this is how I actually met a lot of the exchange operators, or very early exchange operators in the space, guys like Ron Hose at Coins PH, like, you know, and all these guys, right? Because like, they were also actually in these different countries, Pablo from Bitso, like, this is where, like, we all came to you, of course, as well, and Unocoin, like, we all, like, kind of looked at it as being, like, if we can build this network, this payment remittance rails network, uh, we obfuscate Bitcoin away from the user because it's not what's important. What's important is being able to feed their families and give them, the, you know, the, the most amount of po- money possible. Um, <clears throat> and so we built all of this. It was running. It was working. Banking. Boom. Nope. You're probably, you're a Bitcoin company. You're kind of a a remittance company, but we call you a Bitcoin company road up block up. Okay. That makes it very hard. Um, And the problem is, is that in getting it in, this is like what I I realized there's three core things that we need to make remittances work. You need low fees, of course, across the board. What does that comprise of low cost of compliance? If your compliance is as expensive as a bank's is, they charge you more fees. And the whole point is to get, uh, remittances at 1% or less. If you can get remittances on average to a cost of about half of a percent from let's say 3%, 6%, 10%, 20%, <clears throat> you make it basically re- making remittance free is like effectively the goal. Bitcoin has a huge problem. Liquidity, spreads, depths. You're dealing with all of these like interchange requirements from Canada, which has very low liquidity to the Philippines. So we're like, okay, how do we solve for that? How do we hedge? You know, what's, what are different ways in which we can resolve for that? Access to banking, very, very tough to do. Um, and then, it, yeah, it came down to like these three things. We need deep liquidity. We need something that can go without hugely high fees. The Bitcoin network was, has, you know, ranges of fee rates and that makes it sometimes, you know, worth it and not worth it. 
Um, and the biggest thing though, was like the regulatory issue, which led to compliance. Like how do we actually solve compliance? Like if you can solve the cost of compliance and making it so that identity onboarding is free, which unfortunately, whether we are Bitcoin lovers and maxis who don't believe in KYC or not, like in these types of environments, that is a standard. Like you need to be able to identify your customer. And all these things came together to be like, okay, in order to actually solve remittances, you got to solve way more things first. You need to solve liquidity, cost and access to the, that liquidity, the ability for fast moving transactions, the ability for, you know, coins pH to be able to have enough liquidity and spread to make it worthwhile. You know, there were so many other layers and then the banks just blocked everything. And then you're like, doesn't even matter if I solve everything else. Banking, no go. Okay, so that's a tough one. So then we kind of looked at it and we said, okay, so maybe what we need to do is rethink about, you know, the steps to getting there. That was kind of what the realization was, right? It was like, okay, in order to be able to actually solve these problems, you know, Paycase needs to look at different parts and builds out different parts of the space in order to get to that remittance question, right? Um, and, and this is kind of what led us into the TMX. Um, I can talk to someone about that story. The TMX um, is the TSX or how are they connected? Sorry, because most people know the TSX, yeah. but how are they even connected? Yeah, so the TMX group is the second largest exchange holder uh, in the world. Uh, so the uh, ICE, uh, who owns the, NY, uh, the NYSC, is uh -huh. the largest operator on earth. Um, uh -huh. and the TMX group is the second largest. And so, uh, <laughs> Sorry, they, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. They're the second largest exchange holding asset operator in the world. So they cool. own the TSX, they own Montreal stock exchange, they own about 15 around the world. Um, and we at the time had basically, this was like early 2017. Um, we were trying very hard to get banking. Right. And, and there were some actually like, surprisingly, there was a, a core team of, of what, what I would say the most exceptional team of compliance officers in, in being bank of Montreal that were these like, you know, really, really hard Bitcoin guys who were like really starting to get it. And like, you know, chief money, any money laundering officers, guys who you would never dream would be like Bitcoiners. We're like coming to your conferences and your events, Sonny. Like Wear, wearing I love I love shapeshift t-shirts. Yeah, right. And like <laughs> socks and like it was just like this, like, and this is what I mean. Like Toronto was just so amazing, like, you know, in, in terms of it's like bringing of people together. I think like the community is what makes Canada so incredible, right? Like, like I mean, just to like pause on that for a sec. Like, I've never seen an industry or an ecosystem other than in Canada where regulators, heads of the central bank. Uh, analysts for securities regulators, like chief anti-money laundering officers, compliance teams, and hard crypto, Bitcoin, blockchain technologists would all come to the same meetups. And all of us would communicate and learn and talk to one another, right? Like that just doesn't happen like in other parts of the world, right? And that's, that's what made, I think, Toronto and like your events like so unique, right? Like it is very, very odd, maybe less so today, but at that time, like this was fringe. And yet we had central bank analysts we had like the heads of departments of finance like this was amazing it was an incredible cluster right and i think it led to a lot of the knowledge share and transfer um anyways to get back to it so um we worked very closely with with this team they they still today work very closely with us on other projects and, and really kind of keep you know, Bitcoin safe from regulation as things are really starting to advance in the regulatory space i can get to that later um, and one thing led to another, we found a really great relationship with the Toronto Stock Exchange operator, the TMX. And my view is always that in order to make Bitcoin work in Canada in the long run was that we actually needed to go head into compliance. So we needed to go head into regulation and we needed to help solve the policy problem because these, the, the functions of us not being able to get banking, not being able to get these basic things done is because regulators don't know. Like we need to educate the people that we're bringing into our world, right? And if we don't do that, how can we ever expect Bitcoin to evolve and adapt and not be looked at negatively, right? Um, so we basically found a very good, you know, at the time relationship with the TMX group, which is the, T the Toronto Stock Exchange operator. Uh, we entered into a joint agreement between the TMX group and the Toronto Stock Exchange 
uh, and their subsidiary and the Bank of Montreal. So we were the first com company, I think actually in the world today, uh, maybe I think Gemini and Coinbase finally just got global banking like three months ago. But Paycase even is still today was the first company and probably almost the only company in the world that had tier one banking under a crypto directive policy. Um, and this was all built in compliance by the compliance officers and teams in the Bank of Montreal um, in order to uh, enable this type of a crypto business banking account where we had just normal banking, right? Um, so uh, one thing led to another. I can't just talk too much about what ended up happening with the TMX, of course. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, 2017 and 18 markets were on fire. Uh, the institutions, and that was the first time I noticed that like the institutions were starting to come. Uh, one thing led to another. Um, there was just a, I'll say bear markets are in our space, change a lot of people's views and thinking. Um, and I think it takes some, some time or some global catastrophic events like a pandemic to really show the value of Bitcoin. Um, and it, I just it, think that, they, yeah. It yeah. Just, but just on that point, like you just said, you know, you would like face these insurmount, seemingly insurmountable challenges. And, but then somehow you ended up partnering with some of the largest institutions yeah. in the world, one being a bank and one being a stock exchange yeah. um, you know despite where that ended up going for better or worse just curious how does one even do that like, yeah how, like i mean maybe it's hard to sum sum it up in a few words but like yeah because like one of my for doing this show is to like inspire other people to do stuff like we've done and even bigger yeah. right and so how do you demystify that so a yeah you know what it is i think that there's a lot of uh anthony diorio was actually very pivotal to 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 the initial part of this but you know, like this is what I, and I say this about I, like when, when we deal with central banks today and regulators and policy and like all, like everyone are human. Like we're all people, right? Like it's not like the guys mm -hmm. living in the, working in the bank or any different mm. than you and I, like we share mm. core things. We're interested. We all share this idea of fascination and the idea of the future. Like everyone is excited for things that could be different, right? Like, so like mm. there's this core thread of like, you know, it's like, this is all interesting. It's not like regulators are inherently terrible people. They're, you know, and it's mm. the same thing with banks. They're not inherently bad individuals, but you need to be able to present and approach them and, 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 and take the time to educate them in the ways in which they need education. Compliance needs to understand that they know how to monitor a crypto, that, you know, if there is terrorist financing, they can track it, right? Like, it's these simple little building blocks. I would say like what really led to uh, the, the nature of that, of that, that relationship or set of that, that, the deal um, was that we had, you know, found people in these organizations who are true Bitcoin and for lack of a better term, blockchain believers. These are people that actually saw the future. Um, you know, Peter Conroy, the TMX, to be honest, like he was, he was the biggest believer that you could imagine. And he saw a world where security tokens and digitization of, you know, the stock exchanges would fundamentally transform. And Bitcoin was this very powerful new resource um, in an entirely different digital economy. And to have someone of that magnitude being able to, to you know, come out in front of, um, you know, his peers to say that was, was really what it, you need. And you need the compliance officers and the AML officers who understand it, right? Like the reason Bitcoin's had a hard time is the people that need to understand it or not be given the education. It all comes down to getting them comfortable, letting them play with it, send them a Bitcoin, send them an Ethereum, show them how it works, show them how Chainalysis works. These are all mm. of the things that led to, um, you know, like you need people that believe. And, and when you have people that believe, the economics has to make sense. So when the economics makes sense, great things happen, right? Um, and, and to be honest, I will say that I think that the more expensive Bitcoin becomes, uh, the more it, it becomes attractive to the wider institutional audience, right? Um, and so, you know, it's not easy going from 3K to 20K, then back to 4K. Like, that's a big swing for an institution to look at. That's a tough pill to swallow, right? And trying to understand like the long versus short term understanding of what Bitcoin is or our ecosystem, right? Um, and so I won't talk too much more about it. Um, but it was, uh, it was an incredible experience. And, and it gave us this, this ability to understand how to work with institutions, right? 
Um, and, you know, we did everything, you know, under the earth to make sure that, you know, we, uh, we got the, the deal to a really good place and it was, um, I know you're and, not so, able yeah. to comment on, on the exact kind of outcome of that, but, but just in general, though, what came out of it from, from pay cases side though, is yeah. kind of the pay case markets offering and the BMO yeah. pieces that's still, is that all still intact? And how yeah. That so that? today I think coin square went through a tough time. I'm not sure if they still have it. So we basically were the first people in Canada to get tier one banking. Um, I think coin square was able to achieve that just off the back of ours. I know they shut that program down, let's call it. So we're still still the only tier one banked um, digital asset company in the country today. Um, we have the ability to do full OTC, uh, any type of you know exchange transactions, custodial uh, is coming, let's call it. Um, and we are working on some some new institutional potential projects um, in the not the same as the the, the TMX, but in a different capacity. Uh, but yeah, but that's really led to Paycase Markets being able to provide access to Bitcoin across the Canadian landscape, right? Um, and that's something that we're rolling out more uh, over the next few months. Uh, we're kind of going really, 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 really deep onto the, the product side today. We're about to roll out a lot of stuff pretty soon. Just giving people the easiest and cheapest ways to buy Bitcoin. And, and you know, I think that... Um, I, I think that people don't really realize like, what it means to have full financial institution support, right? Like, you know, we, I've, we've been through the days in, in, um, in coin center where we're paying huge fees for banking and it, it ends up costing the consumer right at the end of the day. Right. So like our ability to provide, you know, BMO full in and out access deposits very, very quickly. What does that mean? Like what does huge... that mean for end users? Yeah. Though? Like why would they it, care that, that you're with like a proper it, tier one bank yeah. versus the others who maybe aren't? So, if you look at the largest exchanges today in a lot of your capacities, they don't have access to banking. It means that you have five to seven day withdrawal timelines. It means that your fees that you're charging is not, it's three, two, five percent sometimes. Like it depends, right? Uh, your ability to actually move large sums of money is is blocked. Like maybe you can do $3,000 or $5,000 interact, you know, transfers. Like the way that our banking works is like we can move any amount of money anywhere around the world in pretty much under 30 minutes and like, it's as if you're running a normal business into crypto that's foreign. And most people don't realize that it adds. So like for the consumer, it adds to slippage and time. It adds to massive costs. Um, it adds to delays in actually re returning your money back to you. Oh, you, one sec, I can't. Oh, sorry, man. That's my bad. Is <laughs> no markets mostly offering solutions to can Canadians or is it a global audience or so we yeah so we are per we are going to more and more provide to global uh today we have clients that spend actually globally so yes so like on the OTC side um that's what we do do um we will be expanding that uh, more to the retail side uh pretty pretty soon as well um and yeah, and like, you know, we like the one thing about us is like, we, you know, the, there's another side to the story, which is like a lot of the regulations in the world, like we, our teams helped build, right? And so like, we not only know how to partner with the biggest financial institutions, but it was also because we were writing regulations in countries around the world, we're directing policy, we're guiding policy. So from an institutional perspective, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like we, 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 we help create the future that we, we think is important uh, and it provides the ability for new institutional offerings to come into the market. Um, and, and yeah, and so whether that's local or global. So, so Joseph, I definitely, I mean, I, I kind of knew coming into this one, this is going to be like a double or maybe triple parter here. Um, so I don't want to rush. I do want to make sure we take our time. Um, yeah. But, I, but I, I know there's a lot more still in this story. Where are we in terms of like timelines? Like, are we even at 20, like 14, like when did Paycase Markets and this whole TSX thing kind of happen? And then like, when was the birth of Paycase Markets, I guess you could say? And um, so, so basically the... The TMX deal was effectively uh, end of 2017, early 2018, I guess you can say. Uh, well, that's when it was announced. Um, we put basically pay case markets into effect midway through that. Um, the, the, the actual deal with the TMX was to have them deploy institutional offerings. Um, and that was kind of, we had said, listen, okay, we don't need to do the OTC desk. We'll let them do it or try to do it and figure it out. Uh, it was a, one of many parts of our, our deal. Um, and so we only just basically, we've been doing private transactions for private institutional customers for quite a while. This isn't anything new, uh, you know, friends and high nets, et cetera. Um, but we're kind of really bringing it out, let's say now to a, a wider public. 
Um, yeah, so, and, and, yeah, and you know, like I yeah. said, I think I think we should probably like maybe take some time and go into some of the other big things you've done. But do you want to maybe yeah. touch a little bit on the OECD uh, element? Because, yeah, because. I think that's important. Um, and I was there last year and saw how much of an impact, you, you know, you've played uh, there, but yeah. also uh, kind of how that narrative maybe fits into Shift. I know Shift recently partnered with Binance and a lot of major yeah. exchanges that was on Coindesk. So can you maybe just uh, maybe take us home a bit? And then, like I said, maybe, you know, we'll just, it'll be a bit of a teaser. We can go into it and maybe on a follow-up <laughs> whenever you're free. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, one of the big core pillars we recognized in like 2016 17 was like there was no early guys in crypto who were actually understood what bitcoin was and how it worked you know at the like fundamental level and that were educating policymakers right and like my view has always been if we want bitcoin to survive and succeed in the light it can always survive in the dark but like we want bitcoin to see mass adoption and one of the core pillars is getting policy right and getting regulation right. And so um, <clears throat> one thing led to another, uh, myself and a partner of mine, Loretta Joseph, um, started, uh, we were initially advising um, FinTrack in Canada. She was in Australia. She was working with ASIC, their securities regulator, uh, helped be, build a lot of their uh, crypto regulations. And these paths kind of collided. And we had a champion that had moved to the OECD. Uh, his name's Greg Medcraft. Uh, so he runs the financial directorate of the OECD. The OECD, for people who don't know, uh, was formulated after World War II. Uh, it was basically built on the back of the reconstruction of Germany, let's say. Uh, and the goal of it was to unite um, the G30, well, not G7 or 20, it's more like the G36 and growing. Uh, but it was meant to unite the Western countries together uh, in order to engage in social discussions and to actually build policies to better the world. Uh, I'm not gonna comment on whether they do or not better the world, but let's just, that's just the idea. Um, and so the, it was, it's effectively acting, acts as a research uh, uh, division of the world economies, right? And so uh, whether you're Canada, United States, Europe, doesn't matter, whoever, whichever country, uh, you, the, these policy might, makers and regulators look to the OECD for research and policy guidance that therefore leads and directs the rest of the world on behalf of the G20. Uh, and so if you could think of the best place to enable adoption or at least an understanding of where crypto you know, is and needs to go for the world to adopt it, there's no better place to go than the OECD. Like that is the place that writes the guidance that enables uh, countries to go to regulation or to go into the certain uh, view of the world. <clears throat> and so, uh, one thing led to another, we were, you know, it was probably the most amazing, like, first few experiences, walking in there and just, like, raggedy shirt, like, we're, you know, we're in, like, the most upper echelon, you know, you know, division of the world's, like, policy, it's, it's you know, and I'm walking in there in sweatpants. And walking in where? In, into the OECD in Paris, right? Like, oh, and, just because you guys was, got a meeting, you mean? Or... Yeah, like, so we oh, okay. were brought into the OECD, um, Greg mm. Medcraft, who is an incredible individual, an incredible man. Uh, he runs the, the, the financial directorate and he said inside the OECD is like, how do we not have an immense focus on, you know, blockchains as they like to call them or DLT as the traditional world calls them. How do we not have research and understanding on this massively fundamental technology that is about to literally permeate the lives of every person on earth? Like, this is insane. This is crazy. He put his neck out on the line. He, and he brought us in. And so uh, I was the and first what year of, is this now? 20, you this said? is 2018. Mm. Uh, like, uh, <clears throat> so this was uh, the end, early, end of 20, mid, mid 20, uh, mid 2017, uh, end of 2017. Um, <clears throat> and this is also Bitcoin's going to 20K, you know, like things were really on. Um, and so the, the early discussions, right, actually, when we were announcing the TMX deal in Canada, I was actually at Davos, Switzerland with the OECD on behalf of, of them. Uh, we ended up meeting, you know, heads of states and, and pr premiers of Bermuda and prime ministers and world leaders. Uh, and there's a lot of like crypto people at the crypto, you know, Davos, but I'm talking like the real Davos here, um, where they have like the real, the real discussions. And, uh, and yeah, and, the, and Greg and, and the OECD were really driving this narrative that like, listen, we are about to go through a fundamental breakthrough in pretty much how society and the fabric of society works here. 
like this needs to be front and center on the agenda of every single BIS, FSB, um, OECD mandated country. And so what ended up happening with there is that it led to the, the foundation of the Blockchain Research Policy Institute inside the OECD. Uh, our research and our initial education at that time, just me and Loretta and, and another uh, gentleman named Ben um, and, and others that then came in, of course, after, um, we led to the mandating of the G20 um, with a commitment to uh, focus on a few core objectives. So the OECD writes recommendations to the G20. Uh, the G20 then says, okay, we want the world's policy leaders to focus on three core areas. Not to kill crypto, not to ban crypto was the initial goal. Like make sure that these things can survive and thrive, but there are areas of risk that need to be understood. And like, as we go through these changes, we need to be able to research and understand and educate the rest of the world's leaders around these areas. Um, and so of course, what ended up happening was then the G20 mandated that the Financial Action Task Force uh, take a harder stance on KYC, which we can get to in a minute for better and for worse. Taxation was the big question that they're trying to solve at the OECD level of, as it pertains to digital assets and crypto. But uh, for the majority of other things, it was really about like, how do we ensure free markets are still free? And that like, we don't make Bitcoin illegal. Like that has been the biggest achievement, I think, is like, there is this adoption happening in policy where Bitcoin is not going to be illegal. It cannot be. These things are driving more innovation and more good than harm. Um, and, oh man, uh, Joseph, so there's so many things I want to ask. So many things I need to go yeah. into. You know, Ray Dalio I, recently said that Bitcoin is going to be banned. So, I mean, yeah. you know, I don't I don't buy it. Uh, and I think you, I, we all have experiences. <laughs> but listen, I, I also want to be mindful of your your calendar and your time. I know you have a hard spot, a hard stop in two minutes. So, yo, you yeah, want to finish this afternoon or something? And we can just jump Whenever. Back I've been like... saying to you, whenever. I just want to, I want to do okay. this. And if it's four hours long, it's four hours long. I don't care. But I think a lot of these things are important and people need to know why we're doing what we're doing. And Yeah. You know what I mean? I like that. Yeah, whenever you That's want. Great. Okay, wait, wait. It was not done yet in terms of the recording. So before, let's no, stop okay. that first. But before we do, uh, just I want people to know where they can maybe just like learn about you, your projects. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, because we're gonna close this video uh, out, right? So okay, at Joseph Weinberg uh, on Twitter. On Twitter. Mm -hmm. At Joseph Weinberg on Telegram. Uh, Joseph at paycase.com. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So fascinating, great start. I think we laid the kind of the foundation and, and Joseph, as I mentioned before, is I know you're super busy. You have a crazy million things to do, but if we can once a week, even, you know, give people a bit of insight into where we are yeah. with our project, what's going on, what our thoughts are on the space. I think people would really appreciate it. I know, I know the following Let's, followership's quite low, but this morning I saw the Max Kaiser interview has over 600 views, less than a week. That's good. Weeks, so. That's good. So we can are, do like weekly recaps. I'm down. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Okay. So I'm gonna kill it now, and then we'll uh, we'll Part reconvene two. later today.